This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geeks, show number 219, recorded on June 18th, 2015. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, all three engines up and burning, 2, 1, 0, and liftoff, the final liftoff of the planets. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all your favorite tech gadgets that find out your News, reviews, product updates, and conversation all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the Average Guy TV studios here in a beautiful Bellevue, Nebraska. We got out today, played a little ultimate frisbee right after work today with the interns there at Gallup. And of course, we post the show with world class show notes out at the, uh, the Average Guy. TV. If you have questions, comments, or contributions, of course, you can send me an email. And that's a good way to do it. Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv. You can track me down on Twitter at Jay Collison or call in those questions. Nobody ever does, but it's okay. Thanks, Neil. for con- Neil calls. He's faithful. Neil calls in every week to encourage me in this. You could, too. 402-478-8450 or record those. You can, it's a little bit easier if you record your messages and just email them to me. They sound a little bit better that way, but uh, we'll play those right here on the show. TheAverageGuy.tv is powered by Maple Grove Partners. Of course, you know Maple Grove Partners. That's Christian and, and uh, people you know and you trust. And, of course, if you're looking for web hosting along those lines, uh, especially with WordPress, uh, Christian does it better than anybody else starting a podcast, maplegrovepartners.com. I want to thank him. He's That kid is working super hard for me. So, Christian, thanks for what you do uh, for hosting here and hosting us. I want to thank Roger over at w- WLMN Radio. Of course, they broadcast us live each week. So, Roger, thanks for doing that out of Grafton, West Virginia. It's kind of fun to be over Truster or Radio. And if you are in Grafton, we'd like to hear from you. Mike, I still haven't heard from anybody from Grafton. And ever? I haven't either. No, I, I put out another feeler last uh, you know, two days ago and still haven't heard yeah. anything. But we're waiting. We're waiting. Come on, Grafton. Pull it together. I know you're on the road. You're driving on. You're driving in your car right now, and you're listening to this. Where you're on. I think I'm on from 10 to 11 each day there, and I think – Open mic night is on, you know, afternoon, morning. I always forget my schedule. I always forget. I think it runs at night. So if you're driving, don't do anything. But if if you if you're listening to this, you know, jot this down. Jim at theaverageguy.tv. Just send us a note. All we want to know is if you're listening from Grafton, West Virginia. Kind of fun for us to do that, and uh, so let us know. Of course, Home Gadget Geeks is a part of the Geeks Network. Find this show, uh, links to this show, and many other great podcasts out at thegeeksnetwork.com. You can join us in chat, watch or listen live on YouTube or on Spreaker. You can listen live on Mixler at the same time as well. Find all the navigation, everything you'll ever need over at TheAverageGuy.tv. All right, well, you already heard from Mike tonight. Mike, thank, uh, thanks for coming back, and uh, good to have you on the program. Yeah, thanks. It's been, you know, it's that College World Series time. We I mentioned know. it last week. It's been a fantastic week, just my favorite time, mainly because the food trucks park right outside my work during College World Series, so I get some fantastic lunch. Pretty fantastic. So, yeah. yeah, Omaha is a buzz. Oh, a Gallup sits right over the the home of the College World yeah, Series. You have the so perfect view, out. dude. It's so awesome. <laughs> we, we are, we are, uh, we're we're certainly blessed to have that. And uh, speaking of that, tonight we got with with us Ryan from Silicon Prairie News. Ryan, thanks for coming on. Appreciate you having you know, on your program. Yeah, thanks so much, Tim, and thanks, Mike, and uh, it's, I'm glad to be here and glad to chat a bit about the Silicon Prairie. Yeah, and so, you know, we've been talking about it. You you were kind enough to put a link for Cyber Frontiers on the site a couple weeks back. We got some, some good folks to come over. I've got some tracking, so we kind of know what's <laughs> way over. I have no idea who listens, though, at that point. At that point. But thank you for doing that, by the way. That was Absolutely. Uh, very kind of you to to uh, promote the, the College Kids podcast there on Cyber Frontiers. But Let's uh, let's back up a little bit. Let's get to know a little bit about you. So tell us your background. You know where you're from, how you kind of got into this, what what you've done in the past. Just give us some lowdown so we know who you are. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I grew up in the Omaha area. Uh, went to Elkhorn High School for people around Omaha. They know what that means. Kind of out in the suburbs, and uh, went to college in uh, Iowa. And uh, then went on to grad school, and I did an MFA in creative writing at the Art Institute of Chicago. So I spent a couple years in Chicago. I was basically within the shadow of Wrigley Field um, from my apartment when they would hit a home run, uh, which wasn't too often. When I heard when there was a home run, uh, easy, I, on fans, <laughs> easy on the Cub fans. Easy on the Cub When when they hit a home run, I could hear it from my uh, my apartment uh, deck. So that was kind of cool. And uh, then. Uh, went back to Iowa. I was a 
a writing professor for several years and uh, taught writing for a while and realized that uh, kind of the way education was going, um, I didn't want to be a part of higher education. So uh, I went into writing to write, and so uh, I came back to Omaha, and I was a uh, f did freelance writing and editing. I was the editor at the Sundance Film Festival in Utah for a season. Um, I'd done a lot of ghost writing, uh, promotional writing, web writing, um, basically uh, editing ebooks, all kinds of stuff like that. So, uh, and then when I was in the middle of doing that, when a friend of mine from a uh, uh, friend of mine from AIM contacted me, and he was like, "Hey, do you do you want to apply to be an editor at Silicon Prairie News?" Which I had followed for years, and I knew the people there and all that kind of stuff, and. And uh, I was like, I, th I thought you worked at AIM. He's like, I did work at AIM. We just acquired SPN. So uh, that happened back in February, and I've come on board, and it's just been kind of a rocket ship ride since then. I've been uh, been all over the region in Iowa and Missouri and Kansas, um, just meeting entre uh, tech entrepreneurs and, and uh, uh, everyone in kind of the startup community around here, and it's been a really, really great time. So. So just uh, just since February, here. right? Coming coming on since yeah, February. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. so really new. So for those folks who don't know uh, Silicon Prairie News, give a brief kind of overview of what you know from a history standpoint. It's, it certainly focuses on tech, but give an idea and then and then tell us about mission and purpose. What do you guys really want to be? Sure. Yeah. So Silicon Prairie News started about seven years ago. Uh, it was started by Jeff Slobotsky and Davey, uh, Dusty Davidson. And basically it just kind of started out as a blog. It was, there were all these really cool uh, people doing kind of tech startups and it was kind of, I, I think of it as kind of part of that uh, mobile, uh, mobile social revolution that everyone was a part of. People were making apps, uh, businesses were starting, but no one was talking about it. No one was writing about it. Uh, and so they just were basically going around saying, hey, what, look at all the stuff that's going on. This is all really cool. And uh, kind of around SPN, they kind of formed this community where all these people found each other. Um, people were doing interesting things in tech in the region, uh, but they didn't know other people were. And so SPN became kind of a rally point for that. Um, a couple years in, uh, they started Big Omaha, which is an annual event that happens in Omaha, and it brings together uh, kind of tech leaders from outside of the region and and uh, kind of showcases them. And um, it's always been super, super popular, and we had it this year. It was super popular again. So um, really, SPN just continued to grow, and it covers basically – there's the kind of Iowa, Des Moines, Kansas City triangle would kind of be our core. And then outside of that, the broader Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri area. So um, I would say it's been kind of a a, uh, a catalyst for community. I just coined that. That sounds sounds like I canned it. But no, uh, the write that down for <laughs> <laughs> kind of a catalyst for the community just in the sense that, uh, you know, you have people from all over all over the region from – Columbia, Missouri, to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to Topeka, Kansas, to, um, you know, Kearney, Nebraska, all over the place, uh, people kind of connecting through SPN and, and all that. So um, that's kind of a summary of what Silicon Prairie News. I think that, um, you know, my, my vision for the future is to kind of just build on that. Um, I see uh, it's been an amazing the last few years in the region have just been huge in terms of growth. Um, we have startup accelerators that are that are uh, have all started up in recent years. Code schools, maker spaces, um, just all kinds of really cool support for the startup community. I think that um, a lot of the communities like like Des Moines, like Kansas City, like St. Louis, uh, are really coming into their own. And uh, so I think SPN really needs to. Uh, continue to be that kind of big tent and be that kind of big picture, um, you know, view from 50,000 feet kind of thing and, uh, and kind of highlighting the best, the best of what's going on in the community. So um, it's a really exciting time to be part of the Silicon Prairie. Um, it's, uh, I think that um, we're seeing a lot more traction on basically every level. And I think that, when you hang out with entrepreneurs, uh, there's kind of a 
I don't know, inspired frustration. Like, because, because entrepreneurs of their personality type is always just like, this could be so much better, right? Like we could always make it better. It could always be more awesome. Why aren't thing, you know, like, why isn't the world a better place? That's kind of the entrepreneurial mindset really. So, uh, Anyway, yeah. so it's a really cool optimism. group of people to be a part of. Overflowing optimism for this is going to be the next big thing. No, this is going to be great. No, you got to trust me. <laughs> you know, this, this is going to be great. Just trust me. Where's so exactly. what, is, what is AIM? So you, you mentioned AIM, and for those aren't that aren't in the Omaha area, you know, AIM has been a organization. They've just been on fire over the last uh, five or six years. Acquired really both of the two major conferences that are in Omaha with the Heartland Developer Conference and Infotech, two which I've podcasted out, uh, out of for the last couple years. Big Omaha, another conference that I'm assuming because that was out of Silicon Prairie news that they also are owning at this point. Is that right? Yeah. So three yeah. major conferences are really getting in the entrepreneur space. What do they want? What have they told you? What do they want Silicon Prairie News to be? Or what are, what are your marching orders? You got any you know big, big <laughs> goals that you're thinking? Oh my gosh, they, they want they, they want to go crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's really really cool what's going on at AIM. Uh, they so AIM started back in the '90s and it was really kind of a um, uh, kind of building the tech community back in Omaha in the in the '90s, which was really dominated by um, a lot of kind of large corporations, and so they've been kind of more uh, focused on developing tech talent and the tech talent pipeline for kind of big Omaha corporations. Uh, and I think that they they came to a point where they recognized there's just lots of really cool stuff, innovative stuff that's happening outside of that. Um, and a lot of corporations in Omaha um, – you know, like UP and like HDR and a lot of these large corporations, they're also kind of getting, I think, that innovation bug. And uh, and so I think there was a need for AIM to say, hey, there's lots of really cool stuff happening that's, uh, you know, and we are in the business of building tech communities. So let's kind of, you know, put our energy towards that. Um, what's really cool is that right now AIM is, uh, AIM is in the exchange building, which is the old livestock exchange building in downtown Omaha. And uh, they're bringing in a lot of really cool startups. Um, the uh, Straight Shot Accelerator, which is the startup accelerator in Omaha, um, uh, just recently moved into that building. And so um, to back up just a little bit, I think one of the, the uh, I don't know, kind of common wisdom of building startup communities is uh, is that you need to have kind of a singular place where kind of all the startups can get together, where, all, where innovation happens, where all these people kind of bounce randomly off of each other and ideas bounce off of each other. And, and, uh, and I think Omaha, you know, I think there's a lot of really cool startup spaces in Omaha, um, but I think that the AIM building is really going to be one of the first places where you're going to find just this really made, like big density of all of these startups, startup accelerators. Um, you know, we'll kind of see what happens in the in the months to come, um, but I think it's going to be a really cool space and uh, much like. Um, the uh, there's the um, Think Big space in KC and uh, the Gravitate Center in Des Moines, very similar kind of things. These kind of spaces that really kind of bring the community together, and I think AIM's going to be kind of at the forefront of that. And so with with the news organization that you have, right? And, and it mm -hmm. how how do you how does that fit in, and where do you guys want to be when we think about? I mean, you're focusing on startups and entrepreneurs and. And we, we do. Here in Omaha, I think it's the best kept, kept secret in the Midwest. I mean, that's one of those things. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that going on here in the Omaha area. Super fun to be a part of it. How, how tactically do you guys want to plug into that? And if you could, you know, wave a magic wand and do stuff better today, what would you be, be doing today that you're not doing right now around that? Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, our core focus is, you know, uh, raising raising the profile of startups in the region and uh, I think that uh, we still serve that purpose in terms of um, in some ways kind of kind of third-party validation in the sense that you know we'll have startups that they'll say hey you know I sent I sent my material to 
you know, I sent all my promotional stuff to TechCrunch. I sent all my promotional stuff to, you know, all these tech sites. No one's interested in me. No one's paying attention. I just, my press release gets buried. No one's, you know, interested. SPN does a story on us. And all of a sudden, these people want to talk to us. And I think that uh, it's that really simple idea of, you know, if someone hears about your startup, they're going to Google it. They're going to put it in Google. And if they Google it and there's no act, there's no one talking about it, there's no one kind of, there's no kind of buzz about it, um, then I think people, I don't know, maybe that turns people off to, or, or they're kind of like, well, I don't know, maybe we'll wait and see. Um, so I think that we, we, we always will continue, I think, to elevate that. I think that what, um, uh, I think just in terms of my own, in my in terms of my own job, um, I think we just need to continue to raise the bar and the quality of the discussion that we're having. I hope SPN becomes a place where um, we're kind of leading leading discussions about the community, and uh, um, you know, I think that you know the uh, there's a lot of huge trends going on and and. You know, you follow follow Wired or you follow Quartz or you follow whatever sites you're following. Lots of really cool stuff happening with, um, uh, you know, self-driving vehicles, automated vehicles, um, big data, wearables, all these kinds of trends. And I think SPN could probably do a better job of connecting, okay, connecting what's happening with these startups, what's happening with what's going on in the region to these larger trends. Because um, I think that uh, that's kind of maybe part of the missing link a little bit is that people want to see how does this fit into um, what's going on nationally, internationally, all that kind of stuff. So. so as an editor then, when you're trying to build on that quality, you know, it's kind of known that these entrepreneurs, these startups love to talk about themselves and every mm -hmm. single one of them will want to get in front of you and, and tell you their idea, how do you kind of go through and say, okay, these ones are worth writing about, worth making the cut, and these ones, you know what, they're just kind of, they have a big idea, but they're not going anywhere. You know, <laughs> are, do you try and make that determination, or do you try and write about pretty much anyone if they have a solid idea? That is, that's a really great question, because that's the, yeah, that's the question that I ask myself every day. Um, I think that, uh, I, I think that in terms of SPN, we, we are uh, we kind of straddle the line a bit between being journalists, but we're also we also have a mission to be promoting what's going on. So I would say that we often, I guess, I guess to be honest, it's kind of like I I hope that we ask the right questions, um, and that we, our readers can kind of read can read between the lines, so to speak. So you know we're going to ask questions about okay, do you actually have traffic? Do you actually have customers? Do you actually have cash flow? Do you actually, like, are these, you know, like, do you, like, okay, what are your problems? What are your struggles? What's, you know, what's really going on? Who are your competitors? All these kinds of questions. Um, you know, I think that uh, there's not a lot of interest in, you know, us kind of playing hardball with, with companies that people haven't heard of before that are just trying to get their way. And so kind of just get trying to get going. Uh, so I think that, you know, but I, hopefully if, uh, if the people that we talk to and the people we, that we interview, if they give us, you know, a weak answer, we'll publish the weak answer and people can kind of take with it what, what they will. Or, um, you know, I think we have to ask intelligent questions. Um, and I think that we just have to, uh, um, I think that, yeah, I guess, basically, I guess basically that's my answer. We have to ask really hard questions, ask good questions, um, be thoughtful about it. And uh, business is hard to, uh, business is really hard to cover um, because businesses don't always want to be honest about what's really going on. Um, and I think that what SPN has maybe learned in recent years is uh, not to be too cheerleadery and not to be too positive, um, because often if we're too positive about a company, um, some of those people behind the scenes really know what's going on. So all we can do is ask the ask uh, ask really good questions and be really intelligent and thoughtful. And uh, we got a really smart group of readers, a really smart audience, and uh, you know we'll leave it to them to kind of decide, you know what's going to float and what's not and that sort of thing. So, 
do you get pushback from like these young entrepreneurs who obviously maybe have never dealt with PR or being interviewed? They honestly are just, they have this idea and they want to run with it. And when you start asking those hard questions, do they start pushing back at all? Or, or are they usually pretty, here's the honest truth. Here's what we're going through. Yeah. Mike, Mike, get cut out when right in the middle of your question. Can you repeat it? <laughs> Sorry. Oh yeah, no problem. I was just wondering if you get like pushback from these young entrepreneurs who have never dealt with PR or interviewing. And when you start asking hard questions, do they kind of get freaked out or do they, do they do pretty well with it? Um, I think that, uh, if they're pretty new, if they're pretty new to working with the media and working with press, um, those are usually the, the best conversations because they're usually pretty honest. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I guess it's, you know, you're kind of like, Hey, maybe you don't want to tell me that. I don't know. You know, <laughs> their guard um, doesn't go up though. It doesn't, you know, maybe. Right. Yeah. 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 So they're just like, yeah, this is, you know, what's going on. I think that uh, I would say it's, it's the people at the very beginning where they're, they don't realize like uh, they're not, trying to manage their image. Those are really good conversations. And then I would say the other side is maybe kind of this serial entrepreneur where you get, okay, this is my second or third uh, company that I've started. Um, successful or not, at least they, they can say, you know, they can clearly identify what their strengths and weaknesses are. And they can be like, this is really what worries me, or this is what I'm working on, or this is what, I, you know, and, and uh, so those are always really good conversations too. Very cool. Yeah. Ryan, what kind of tech, you know, the, the guys, the, the, uh, my audience are very tech savvy. They're, mm -hmm. Many of them are system administrators, you know, they, they, they work in yeah. big shops. What kind of tech problems, when you got there, what kind of tech problems did you inherit? And what is the, what's a news organization like your size? What kind of tech problems do you guys face? Is is it oh, yeah. or, or are you exposed to that? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Uh, yeah, the tech problems that we faced. I mean, we had uh, pretty early on. We we were transferring over um, all of the site content um, over to different servers, um, and we were doing kind of a, a redesign of the site. Um, I don't know if we ran into too many problems with that. Uh, when we did transfer it over, it um, it took a really long time to propagate. <laughs> so it was kind of like, eh, you kind of like, <laughs> um, even though you know everything's running fine, you know, you're just kind of like holding your breath a bit. But um, but that went that went all that was all very normal. Um, are you guys uh, are you guys a complete yeah. Mac shop in what you do from writing and all that stuff? Is it all Mac? You have PCs involved as well, or how does how do you how it, maybe is it, is it all freelance? So do the do the writers decide? Uh, yeah, I don't know what our freelancers do. I mean, I I use a um, I just got a laptop with Windows on it, um, and um, I'm not sure if we use any Mac stuff right now. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty low key. I mean, we're we're using um, we just recently started using Slack for all of our communication stuff, and we use Google Docs, and we use all that kind of stuff. So, um, AIM uses a lot of just uh, a lot of the Google apps. So that's kind of the main platform that we're doing things through. Um, is that is that working for you so far? Yeah, yeah. So, and this this is gonna sound kind of dumb, but. Um, I did uh, when we were at when we were at Sundance. I did everything with Microsoft Word, and so I got really, really good at using Microsoft Word. Um, and then when I started working at AIM, uh, switching over to Google Docs was just like I just <laughs> not super technical, but mm -hmm. I was sending people I was sending people all these documents with all of these like uh, comments, inline comments, all these corrections, all this kind of stuff, and and uh, people were not not too pleased with that, so I've had to change my ways a bit. But, but you're um, a pretty yeah. technical writer, right? I mean, you, you your background is writing, and so when you're, you need the tech to work for you because you're digging in, you want it written well, and so the tech right. needs to work for you in order for that to happen, right? Yeah, yeah, and I guess my process, maybe I'm, you know, my process for writing a story is, you know, I'll, I'll record the audio when I interview people and I'll take a lot of notes just with pen and paper. Um, and then I either have to make it, I have to, I can't go straight to WordPress. There's just like something in my head, like can't go to WordPress yet. And it's, uh, but I don't wait till I'm finished. So I'll do about 80%. I'll do about maybe 20% by hand. And then I'll do the rest in uh, Word or Google Docs. And then I'll 
you know, finish it up doing, just kind of polish it up on WordPress. But um, I think that's probably just more psychological. Yeah, every, just, every writer you has your, a workflow. You got your tricks, you got your tricks, and, you know, yeah. you do what's comfortable. So. No, I For think sure. you go with what works. I mean, it's the same with podcasters, right? We kind of have a rhythm we get into, and we like to, once we find what works for us, we like to follow that rhythm. So I imagine... You know, it's kind of the same uh, uh, for you from from that standpoint. Since you've gotten there, uh, from a numbers standpoint, how close are you to tracking your own numbers as far as readers and where they're coming from? How much of that is in your target area, and how much do you try and get outside of the target area? I mean, do you try and get read in the Silicon Valley, or do you say, you know what, we're the Midwest, we hope to stay here? What's what's mm -hmm. your thoughts on some of your readership? Yeah. Um... Yeah, we've had we've had uh, really strong growth in our readership um, by basically every measure. I would say geographically, um, our highest traffic is always going to be around Omaha because I think we that's kind of the longest, uh, um, uh, you know, the the kind of oldest audience that we've had. But we we regularly get traffic from all over the country. Um, and I see that basically every time we post it, it gets it gets basically every every part of the U.S. for sure. Um, there And there are a substantial number of people outside of the region, uh, venture capitalists and things like that, who uh, are on our mailing list and, and follow what we're doing and all that kind of stuff. And um, But I would, I would say our core readership remains uh, those entrepreneurs in the region. Um, those are the, the people that we're writing about. Those are also the people that are reading us really closely. And... Uh, I guess my philosophy is really just to kind of, to, uh, you know, invest in the people who are most passionate about what you're already doing. So those people that, the people that write to us, the people that comment on our stuff, the people that share our stuff, the people that um, get super pumped that when we talk about, um, you know, that when I, they will email me and, and you can tell that they've been reading the site. Um, I feel like those are the people that we need to feed and, uh, you know, when um, people outside of the region see that and see the activity that's going on, I think that they can pick up on that, you know, and um, just from a business standpoint, I mean, I think in terms of our job board, in terms of our events, in terms of our ads, in terms of all of that, who's going to be using that? Who's going to be reading that? Who's going to be engaging with um, those other parts of our site? It's going to be people in our region. Um, we're glad to have as wide of a reach as we can. We're glad to have people from all over the world following us. Um, but in terms of who's really going to be engaging with our stuff, uh, I think it's going to be those core people in the, in the region. We have a we have a pretty big following on the East Coast as far as this podcast. Yeah. And so if I was on the East Coast and it's like, hey, Ryan, it's great. I want to read your news, but it's all about the Midwest. What, what what do you say to somebody who is like because you know you're not you're you guys aren't trying to be and you correct me if I'm wrong you're not trying to be TechCrunch mm -hmm. and gadget and right you're not it's not a gadget I'm gonna get the hot headlines we're trying to suck yeah. you into something that doesn't exist right as I go out and look at the site and by the way if you're listening Silicon Prairie News uh, the the easiest way to find that super easy SiliconPrairieNews.com it's out there mm -hmm. scroll down a little bit there's a little still a Cyber Frontiers ad for us <laughs> yeah. thanks again for doing that it's really absolutely yeah. Very cool to see that out there. You should head out there. It, it, you get a couple thousand eyeballs just from folks going to see the Cyber Frontiers. But when you're there, w w what separates you from that, this kind of crazy minute-by-minute -minute news cycle that we've gotten into, even in the tech, when Windows drops the latest build of Windows 10 and everybody's got to launch the, you know, the next 10 features that have come out of it? What separates you guys from that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... I think what's really interesting about our region is just the uh, the community that we have. Um, you know, when we throw big Omaha and we have people come in from uh, Silicon Valley and they come to Omaha and they meet people in the community, I think they're always surprised by um, just the relationships that we all have with each other and, and the, way, um, the way that we're open and vulnerable and we're collaborative and all those sorts of things. And so I think that when... Um, you know, I think that one of the 
I think what you find in, in our region is that a lot of entrepreneurs and people that are developing things, um, they're not just looking to kind of create something and sell it. They're like, how, how quickly can I make something and then sell it off to someone? Um, people are looking for startups that are, um, you know, lifestyle companies where they want, they want to stay with these companies. They believe in them. They're passionate about them. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, people are, I think in the content that we cover and the way that we cover it, you know, we, uh, you know, when we, when we publish, um, you know, stuff, news about investment rounds, or we publish stuff about events, or we publish stuff about um, stuff going on in other communities, uh, I think there's generally just like encouragement, support, um, people are interested to know what other people are doing, not because of competition or not because, um, not because they're worried about keeping up an edge, uh, but that they're just interested in um, how can I collaborate with other people? How can I um, help other people? Um, I mean, the most common question around here is, you know, like, how can I help you? You know, uh, and so I think that in the terms of the stories that we do, yeah, we want to talk about, hey, there's these amazing people. They're doing awesome stuff. They're getting a lot of traction. Um, they're doing something really innovative. Uh, but I think that in the back of behind every story, it, you know, we're saying, okay, here's someone in our region. This is what they're working on. It's really cool. This is what their challenges are. This is, you know, how they're thinking. And hopefully, and we get, we, we hear this back when we run stories on, on, uh, on different companies or different people, they'll email us and say, wow, like so many people reached out to me after you published that story to help me out with funding or to help me out with running my business or to offer services. So I think it's maybe, it's just really, um, you know, when you, when you follow a lot of other tech sites, uh, you're, it's just like, here's kind of the outside perspective of these people that you've never heard of and, or you've never known personally. Um, whereas I think our, the core audience, and hopefully if you follow SPN from outside the region, um, you'll see that, you know, these are people who know each other, that work together, that collaborate. You're going to see a lot of the same names coming up um, as not just in terms of what they're doing, but how they're helping other people. So. I think it's just, it's a cool, it's a, um, it's a community building site, I think, and, and that makes it really distinctive, I think. One of the things I've always liked about Silicon Prairie News is that the writers always seem to have a good understanding of the technology. And I think that's sometimes really hard. You can definitely tell when you're reading articles, you know, the, the writer really had no idea what they were talking about, but on Silicon Prairie, it's, it's a lot different. They do know. Is that mm -hmm. a hard change as a writer? You know, you guys learn how to write really well. So adapting to the technology sphere and pretty much having to learn a whole other trade in order to right. write about it, do your writers find that difficult or do some of them actually pick it up pretty naturally? Um, yeah, that's another good question. Um, I think that uh, we have to have writers that are naturally curious. I would say a lot of our freelance writers that we have um, have kind of one step one foot in journalism and one foot in kind of the tech scene. Um, and so that's like super helpful when you can find people like that. Um, I think that, uh, um, I think that in terms of the technology, at least when we're doing like profiles and things like that, um, the people that we talk to have pretty good pitches for explaining their products. Um, and so that's usually pretty helpful. And I think, you know, for me, I've um, followed Silicon Prairie News casually for a super long time. So it's not really since it started. Um, and so uh, I think you pick up stuff along the way and, and um, you know, people, people have said that they really appreciate the stories that we run because they can share it with people outside of the community. And it kind of explains what they're doing. Like, hey, mom, like, this is what I do. This is like, and this explains it a bit better, you know? And so they can kind of like, oh, I understand what you do now. So um, I would say we have a, a general but intelligent audience. Um, and so uh, it really keeps you on your toes because, um, you can't uh, you can't make stuff up because we have people that read us super closely, and uh, I think I've learned um, I've I've learned that to embrace the criticism because it means that people are reading closely and they're engaged. Uh, so if people 
you know, tweet us and they're like, hey, you screwed up that link or that's totally incorrect or, you know, they send me emails and they're just like, hey, here's all the stuff you got wrong in your last story. Um, just realize, like, these are, like, super passionate, intelligent people and uh, we got to respect that, you know, and so um, you're constantly learning and, and I think you just got to kind of embrace the um, – embrace that passion even if it whether it's positive or negative or you know whatever you get Ryan honestly that's not all that different than our podcast community to be honest right they, <laughs> they, they listen to every single word we say we get these emails back from them you didn't say this right this was wrong I mean I get that in the chat room sometimes you know from yeah 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 oh, Jim, that's not right you know those kinds of things and you know, I think the key is to is to harness that passion and take advantage of it because they are your most, and many of them are very very gifted, and and so they're, you know, it, it you can see it as criticism from that standpoint, or you can see it as help, and say you know, hey, okay, obviously you have some things to say. Let's take, you know, let's take what that is and and yeah. make it work for you. So yeah, I, yeah, oh, what I what I. Uh, yeah, my kind of test is basically like, okay, take a step back. Objectively speaking, does what they're saying make my site better? Like, does it make us better? And if it makes us better, then you'd be like, yeah, okay, totally, you know. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't make your site better, your podcast better, your content better, then uh, then you're just like, well, I don't know what to tell you. But that's kind of my my litmus test. So. <laughs> it's like, yeah, the chat hey, room says I, they, they trust everything I say. That is totally <laughs> not true. <laughs> right now, it's not true. You had mentioned a while back. You had mentioned putting things in WordPress. Is your technology is Silicon Prairie News? Is that a WordPress site? Or is that what your your back yeah. end? Is? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a WordPress site. Yep, it's oh, WordPress. That's, that's very cool. I mean, that's and what kind of traffic? If I can ask, you, you can say no. But what kind of traffic are you seeing on a weekly or monthly? Uh, basis as far as numbers go. Can can you disclose that at all? Um, I'm not I'm not going to share. Okay, that's fine. And then, <laughs> oh, that was hard hitting journalism right there. <laughs> oh, I had the opportunity. What about uh, what about your funding? This is a question from the chat. How are you guys? Certainly, yeah. Ian bought it. So at yeah. this point, they're they're pumping the money in. It's not like you guys are having to raise money. You're selling ads on the site and some of those kinds of things. Is that mm -hmm. is that how that's working? Yeah. So. Um, SBN followed a route that's pretty typical of a lot of journalism sites and a lot of uh, tech journalism sites. Um, so about, you know, they, they started this website and then about two years into it, they started Big Omaha. And SBN, and, you know, SBN was Big Omaha. Big Omaha was SBN. Um, those were kind of uh, just one in the same, one in the same team. Um, so just like, you know, list off all this, all, you know, all the other tech sites, journalism sites, Basically, any any newspaper, magazine, whether it's the Atlantic or whoever, they got a, They got an event. They got an event. They sell tickets to, um, and so that's kind of that. Uh, it's just a little bit different now in terms of having to really, uh, in terms of Big Omaha, in terms of AIM events, in terms of all those things. Uh, we basically have to define what value do we provide. So, you know, tracking. Okay, so this is. This is in real terms, you know, this is the value that SPN provides to Big Omaha in terms of referrals, in terms of, you know, people signing up and, and all that kind of stuff in terms of the traffic to their site. Um, you know, in terms of AIM, they have a they have a, um, a job seeker system called CareerLink. You know, this is the traffic that we provide to CareerLink. This is that sort of thing. And so we, yeah, we still do our ads. Um, we still... Uh, sell featured job postings on our job board, and then we also track um, kind of the other traffic that we're doing. And uh, I think you know it's a it's a really hard it's a hard grind. And anyone who's done um, journalism and done media, anyone who's done a website, will you know there's there's two parts of it. One is the the content never stops. You just keep going. You got to keep, you know, like you you screw something up one day, and you're just like, okay, on to the next story. Like we just keep rolling, you know. It's it's, uh, it's so funny because it's so similar to podcasting. And so yeah, many, yeah, right. Absolutely. It's a weekly. We have a weekly cadence. We got to do this whether we feel like it or not. We you know we don't have to. Mike and I do this for fun. You you got to do it for a living, right? Right. But, yeah, yeah. But it, there's it's funny as you're talking. There's just so many similarities to it. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'm in. Um, uh, we do we do have to 
find ways to generate money and we do have to develop those and and uh, continue to grow those but uh, I think the cool thing with AIM is that because we're kind of part of their system we can share a lot of resources um, so in terms of hey we need ads well AIM has a sales department okay that's awesome um, you know when AIM needs extra content, well, we do content, so we can we can send content to AIM. So there's a lot of kind of internal internal value sharing where we're sharing um, sharing that, and the main thing is just that we track that and show this is the value that we're providing, and and um, you know, and there's a lot of intangibles too, you know, that um, we have we have a really great connection to a lot of people in the region, um, and so we're able to. Um, promote AIM and talk about AIM and connect people to AIM and, and all that kind of stuff. So that all benefits AIM too. From, from your reader's standpoint, what's the most valuable thing that they can do for you? So there's, you, have a, you have a great reader right out there who's dedicated, reading all the time. How, how does that, how do they become, you know, really good friends of the site, so to speak? How do they become profitable for you in that sense? What's the best possible scenario? You know, what would they do yeah. to help you guys out? Yeah, uh, I would say the one of the I, you know I would say we run a lot of really interesting stories, um, and we have uh, there's some like really active Facebook groups for tech startups. There's like a really active Nebraska Facebook startup group. Um, there's a really active Iowa like Facebook startup group, and so often we'll run a story, and then that gets shared on one of those. And there'll be like a massive conversation, and there'll be like zero comments on our page stories. So we got this weird, like, got this weird thing where like we'll run a story, it'll get major traffic, everybody's talking about it, but like no one's commenting on the like on the story itself, you know? Yeah, on the so, page itself. Yeah, That's on the page itself. So page. All landing and, and, on Facebook, right? I know. Yeah. So they're like, yeah. there are really cool conversations happening. Um, so I mean, I guess I always. I always wished our readers would would kind of come out more and be like put stuff on the site so that you know if you're not following the Iowa Facebook group you can still be part of that conversation and and people still kind of see what's going on um, definitely you know definitely follow us on our mailing list um, you know go to our job board applying for jobs on our job board um, and commenting on things and I think that um, we really do listen to our reader feedback. So if they send me an email and say, hey, I love that story you did, I hated that story you did, um, why didn't you ask this question, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, a, it's a great, you know, to get reader feedback is, is fantastic. So um, yeah, I would say feedback. And it's, you know, a lot of people ask that question. What, like what's the best thing you can do for SPN? And it's like, well, if you like something, share it, like it, promote it, get, you know, tell a friend about it, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that just seems, that seems so kind of, I think people are just like, oh, that's it? Like, that's all you want me to do? But it's, but seriously, like, I mean, just even strictly in terms of analytics, right? Like just in terms of data, it's like, if like we will continue to do the things that people respond to uh, and we will stop doing the things that no one responds to. So um, have a genuine reaction to our material. If you really don't like something, I don't want you sharing it because then that throws off, you know, like that throws off what we're trying to track. Right. So, um, you know, just be, yeah, if you love it, you know, let people know. So many similarities to podcasting. It's so funny. You just you you hear it, and then, <laughs> but but it's 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 good to hear it though from someone who does this as their full time job and for you know a company, a you know a successful right, yeah. news organization to hear that they're you know the the uh, analytics and stuff like that, that they're looking at the looking at the shares, the likes, seeing what people like. It's it's all it all comes back to that same. You sort want of to drive people back to your site, right, Mike? I mean, we talk about this yeah. all the time. We're trying to get you know be careful not to get your podcast on too many other networks because then the network you're driving people to those networks. So when you think of a Podomatic or a SoundCloud or some of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so it, we face, it's funny, we face a lot <laughs> of the same issues along those lines. And, and no surprise, right? I mean, really the blogging podcasting space is very, very similar in that sense. Right. How you use those. Well, the, yeah, it's the same. I mean, same thing with your, with your mailing list or your Facebook or all that kind of, it's like, well, 
I mean, we love to have more people on our mailing list, but what we really want on our mailing list are super engaged people, right? right? <laughs> like, right. we want people that are passionate about what we're doing. Yeah. So, like, I don't want, you know, I don't want 100 people to just sign up on the mailing list and then not care about SPN. Like, I want people to find SPN and be on involved in there who really care about what we're doing. So, those that that actually goes does a whole lot more for us than just like strict numbers, you know, so. Yeah, no, we're the same way. I mean, I, I've told people, you know, I've had podcasters say to me, well, don't you, you know, don't, you should do this because don't you want thousands or tens of thousands of listeners? And I'm like, really, <laughs> I want engaged listeners, right? That's exactly. what I want. I, I exactly. don't care how many. I just want them to be engaged in what they're doing because it's so much more interesting that way when when the listeners are engaged in what you're doing and you're getting good feedback and you're getting, you know, yeah, you're getting stuff. When you can show up and you know, we do a, a meetup in Indianapolis every fall. Uh, this one, this year, it'll be September 12th. Mike's gonna head down with me. We get 35 guys from all over the United States that come to Indianapolis and we hang out for a weekend and talk tech. And it's awesome to hang out with with these listeners. I they hear me all the time. I never get to hear them. <laughs> right? That's the other side. And I imagine for writing for you it's the same way. You put it out, right? You don't they yeah. know you. They know your writing, but you don't know them. You know? Yeah, that was that was actually really funny at Big Omaha because I was uh, we were work, you know, I was involved with putting out content on SPN and attending Big Omaha. So I go back to the, you know, the press area. I'm working on like, okay, let's do stories, let's do interviews. You know, we're publishing stuff. I go out and talk to people. We go back and publish stuff. I go out and talk to people. And you, and it, all of a sudden, I get this like stage fright, which I usually don't have, where you just like. I'm literally publishing things and then walking out and those people are like reading it on their phones, you know, like as we just sent this out. And so you're just kind of like, wow, like those people that I'm that I'm always writing to, those people are right there, like in the other room. It's just like a little bit freaky because you're like, I mean, I always know that we're writing for this larger audience, but when you actually, those people are right there and they're literally reading it like right after you wrote it, right after you, you know, publish this stuff. It's just kind of like, whoa, like, you know, this is like a little bit too real. So Yeah, no, it, it is a little <laughs> odd when uh, we, you know, we're on video all the time. And, and so I've had people say, I've heard you before. I've watched you before. I have no <laughs> idea who they are. I had, uh, I was in a situation at work because we podcast at work and somebody from Japan came. And so like, I've watched every video you've made. <laughs> you know, like, oh, this is creepy. You know, oh, yeah. great. I'm not gonna lie, man. That that is a bucket filling day for me, right? I am. Yeah. That's a great day. That's what, as podcasters, Mike. I mean, right? That's what we kind of live for here, right? As, I'm as, waiting for my first one, so I'll let you know when it happens. But well, yeah, we live for it. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty awesome, Ryan. For you, must be the similar kind of experience when someone finds you and they're like, "Oh, I read this article," and then they start talking to you about it. That's got to be a great day, right? Yeah, yeah, that's um yeah, one of the first things you one of the first things you learn is like if if people come up to you and they start one of they start saying bad things about your site, you start to listen really carefully to be like do they actually follow it? Like do they actually do they drop anything and you realize like 99% of the time they don't actually read your stories, you know, like they don't actually they just read the headlines or whatever and they're just mad about the headlines. Um but then, yeah, it's so great when you when you meet someone because people say, "Hey, I love that story you did." Okay, yeah, I get that a lot. And then they'll say something else, and you realize, "Wow, you were actually like you were reading that, like you actually were tracking." Yeah, it's a good day. You it? were feeling what I was feeling, you know. Yeah. And uh, so that's 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 really cool. And that's really the engagement you're looking for, right? I mean, when yeah. you say engagement, you're like, read through the article, have an opinion, don't be a troll, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think that engagement is a is a term that gets thrown a whole lot around in content marketing, and uh, I think that it's probably a worn out phrase when people talk about like, oh, we need to have user engagement or we need to have employee engagement or whatever. You know, um, I think that that can get overused. But I think exactly what you're saying that when we talk about engagement, what we really mean is that spark between two people where you're like, you know, you put something out into the universe. Hope that someone picks it up, you know, and that's that's an awesome feeling. Yeah, no, for sure, it's the best when 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 you engage back and you get to have that conversation. It kind of what drives us into media. And I, I did some, I did a bunch of writing before I started podcasting, and I really enjoy it. And I'm 
found that I've started podcasting, it's just really easy er to podcast than it is to sit down and write. And you uh, know, and, mm-hmm. and maybe a, I'm a little better at podcasting than I was writing. I'm not a great writer, but I enjoy doing it. You know that kind of writing where it's I write for me, and uh, and I enjoyed it. But uh, one of those just kind of things where I just really enjoy the interaction when you get a chance to meet the meet the listener or or have these. I'll be honest with you, my I love, and this is why we're having you on, is I love the smaller uh, underdog. You know, the entrepreneur, the startup. We have a lot of those guys on here. I had this thought. I need to connect with you more on. You need to feed me more entrepreneurs that are ready to be interviewed, right, in, in this sense, so that we can, you know, we can interview them on the program. Yeah, I, you probably lost me for a little second there, Ryan. I, yeah, I yeah, I lost that. you a little bit. We, we, I, was, I was telling you, we, you could be feeding me, you know, these are local entrepreneurs. You could be feeding me the best of what you've got to get them, get them on the program here. We yeah, love yeah. entrepreneurs here. And, you know, I'm wearing a Media Fire t-shirt tonight. Those guys were entrepreneurs in Austin, Texas, Eight years ago, starting up web, ho- you know, web storage and cloud storage stuff. We love those kind of interviews. Um, yeah. So if, as you see those, um, uh, send them our way, and we'll get him. We'll get him here on the show. Let yeah, me ask yeah. you. We because we are a gadget show. Let me ask you just a little bit about your gadgets. Are you a gadget guy? Do you do you do you got you have many, or are you kind of like, hey, I got my laptop and I'm good. Um. Yeah, I mean, I I guess I'm probably a. a a gadget person in the sense that in the way that anyone like probably around my age is probably a gadget person. Like I'll be, uh, you know, there's been times where like I'll be in the car with my wife and I'll be like, I'll have, uh, I'll be doing something on my phone, on my Kindle. She's got her iPad going. Uh, her phone's hooked up on Bluetooth through the, you know, she's talking to someone on the phone through her car, through Bluetooth, you know, and then, you know, my dad is, uh, you know, my dad will send me a text about like what his Fitbit's doing today. You know, like he'll give me a Fitbit update on. You know, so it's just like I think that it's one of those things where you yeah. you think like, hey, when's the future going to happen? And then you realize that like you're working with five different screens and you didn't even you didn't even think about it. Like all of a sudden you're like, we got we got a Kindle, we got an iPad, we got two phones, we got our car, we got GPS going. We're <laughs> and, and it's crazy. Yeah, and you're just like, oh, I guess we're here, right? Like, you know. So iPhone or Android? Uh, iPhone. The only reason I was going to get an Android, the only reason I got an iPhone is that my grandma has an iPhone. And I thought, am I going to explain, like, how to do Skype with her? Or am I just going to do, like, can we just do iPhone to iPhone? We'll just, we'll just do voice or uh, video chat like that. And uh, so I thought, okay, that's going to do it. Of course, I don't do that as often as I should, but... I think that is like the most caring, thoughtful thing I've heard in regards to the iPhone. I got it. <laughs> so I didn't have to teach my grandmother how to use Skype. Like that's the sweetest thing. I'm gonna use that as an example. I know a guy. If, it, I, <laughs> if you're not convinced that you want to buy an iPhone, let me tell you this story. Okay, your grandma's gonna have one, and she's gonna love it. That's why you need it. <laughs> oh, that's pretty awesome. That is a good story. That is a good story. Well, and I'm a I'm an iPhone convert as well. I've been an Android guy for a long time, and not Mike didn't influence me. Let's just for the record, I did this long before I started podcasting with Mike, and he's our Apple guy in our. That's our story, and we're sticking to it. Uh, but uh, yeah, he he liked to believe that, but. Yeah. Uh, no, I've made the change. I, I'm not looking back, although I'm a Windows MVP as well. So I have a Surface that's sitting right here on the desk that's actually running the entire broadcast at this point. And mm-hmm. and I've been a Windows guy and enjoy Windows. That's just that's what works for me. You know, we're in this age now where I'm kind of I'm kind of done fighting over stuff. It's kind of like what works. Like what works for you? You have a Garmin right. 220 uh, Forerunner 220 <laughs> watch. That's dynamite. Yeah. It's not smart. I mean, it is. It keeps track of GPS, but. It does exactly what I need it to do, which is keep track of running time, right? That's what I need. That's yeah. what I need it to do. I don't need the notifications on my wrist. I can get them off my phone. That works on my workflow. But yeah. it's different for everybody. So we try not to get in here. We try not to get into those discussions. We're kind of like, what works best for you? If it's helping your productivity, do it. If it's not, yeah. get rid of it. You know? Yeah. One of my one of my regrets again, the iPhone was um, I like I love tracking all the stuff that's going on with virtual reality, like following you know all the subreddits and everything on everything that's happening with virtual reality, watching all the videos of people freaking out with the Oculus Rift and all that stuff. And so a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, 
you know, virtual virtual reality sets, a lot of them want are Android based, mm -hmm. and so you're like, oh, you know. So I still got I still got my Google Cardboard. I got my Google Cardboard, and it kind of works pretty well with my iPhone. So, um, but hopefully, um, I think the new I think the new Google Cardboard is is uh, is made for uh, um, iPhone too, where it works well for iPhone now. So, yeah. Yeah. better. But That's my my, my Google Cardboard is like totally falling apart now because I like took it to like every group of friends I have, like, hey, check out the virtual reality, you know. And then now it's all it got all sweaty and it's nasty. Oh. And <laughs> it's cardboard, right? It's cardboard. Yeah. You're like. That's the amazing thing. It's just cardboard. It's so. just cardboard. Well, and then we think about the augmented reality that's coming. Things with like Hololens for Microsoft. Oh yeah. Some some of those cool assistive, right? Where you you blend the world with technology and and man, who would have thought as a kid we just dreamt about those kinds of things? And there, there you said this a minute ago. The future is today, right? I mean, we are live yeah. in the best time ever. <laughs> For, to be a nerd, right? I mean, it's yeah, just yeah. so awesome. I just think about the technology that's around me on this desk that is sick. It's sick yeah. to me how much technology uh, sits on this desk. Yeah, well, I was uh, recently I was reading this book. Uh, I think it's just called 1995, but it's basically just uh, the author just goes back and looks back 20 years at what people were talking about and what were some of the big stories, and they talk about um, O.J. Simpson, and they talk about um, Oklahoma City bombing and all these kind of things. And they talk about, like, the browser wars of, like, Netscape Navigator, like, Netscape Navigator, like, and that was the, like, that's how I, that's how I distinguished myself as being cooler than my friends, was they were all on Internet Explorer <laughs> or whatever. And I was like, or they had, you know, AOL, and I was on Netscape Navigator, and they're like, what's that? And I was like, well, you know, you got to be cool. You got to be in the know to be you know, funny? just like looking Isn't back now, you're just like, this is... It's just crazy. Just, when you came in, you yeah. said AIM. And someone said, oh, not AOL Instant Messaging. Right? I <laughs> yeah. get it now. You know, and it's just funny how we hark back, you know, we hark back to some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really funny. Well, Ryan, great to spend some time with you. Thanks for spending some time around. Uh, we've had you for an hour, so I don't want I, your time is very valuable. Mike and I have some stuff to wrap up here, but uh, we'll say thanks for coming on the podcast, and uh, we'll let you drop off so you can get back to your life. It's late on a Thursday night; nobody wants to hang around forever. But <laughs> thanks for doing the interview. Let's say uh, let's let's hook up again and figure out how we get yeah. some more entrepreneurs, how we get hooked in from a silicon uh, from a silicon prairie standpoint, and how do we funnel some of those entrepreneurs onto the podcast so we get more exposure, right? And and we'll kind of cross, we can kind of cross brand that we've been talking about you on off and on on the podcast. Uh, you know, I joked about Taylor Martinez, which oh, yeah. everybody from Omaha will know. If you got silicon prairie news right now, Taylor has a you guys have an article about his uh, about his app. Is that something you did, or is that something one of the freelance writers or one of the? Was, do you have staff writers? Yeah, or I wrote freelance? that. Yeah, I wrote that. Actually, I did a phone. I did a phone interview with Taylor Martinez, which I, I never uh, imagined I would ever do, but I did that, and that was a, uh, that was a good conversation. It's, yeah, is, uh, is he working with? Most, uh, is he working with the the incubators down in Lincoln? Uh, I think he's, I mean, he's friends with a lot of people yeah. down there, and I think they've been uh, kind of giving him advice. I don't think he has worked formally with any of them, but um, definitely gets a lot of help from people, so. Oh, very cool. Now, like 99% of my audience has no idea who we're talking about, right? <laughs> but if you're in Omaha, and, and you know what? Lately, I've been hearing from my Omaha listeners. This has been pretty cool. All of a sudden, I thought oh, nobody listens to me in Omaha, and just recently, out of the woodworks, I've had all these people pinging me like, "Oh yeah, I live in Omaha, or I live near Omaha," and I have much yeah. a much larger Omaha audi audience than I thought. But of course, Taylor Martinez was a was a quarterback for the Nebraska Huskers, our football team here in Nebraska, and was a big personality in here. And so now he's doing yes. technology. Does he own a company? Is he doing it all? Kind of how, how's he how is he doing that? How's this app? He wrote an app that yeah, helps disabled people, right? Connect. Yeah, Connect. yeah, it's a um, yeah, it's like a it's a social network app. So it brings a, brings together people that um, have disabilities or diseases and kind of creates a network where they can share their stories and share their challenges and share like great things that are happening in their life and all that kind of stuff. Um, I would say it's a it's a philanthropic. Um, 
philanthropic app. And I, you know, when I talked to him, um, you know, I kept, I kept just trying to feel out like, so is this a start of a business? Is this a career for you? Like what's, you know, and uh, he was like, I just like, I just like making apps. I just like making apps. So I don't know what, like, it's definitely his most ambitious project yet. Um, he's created a lot of little app games and stuff like that, but um, I'm not sure if it's a, a hobby that's turning into kind of a philanthropic thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that'll be, I, I don't know, I don't know how it'll work to have a, an app where, you know, a social network where people come on and become extremely vulnerable um, about all the problems and challenges in their life. Um, sound like that could be, I don't know. You, I can imagine that going a lot of different yeah. ways. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, like, and yeah, anyway, but it, I think it's, uh, I wish him well. And, and uh, I, he was, at, he was at big Omaha and to see his hands, he's a quarterback. So he's got massive hands, just like giant hands. And to see him work on like a smartphone is like watching like a gorilla. It's like watching a gorilla, like you know, just like he's just got it's all all upper muscle and massive hands, and like you know, his phone just d disappears in his hands. So anyway, no, but he's a local celebrity in a lot of ways. Everybody yeah, yeah, a local celebrity. Knows who Taylor Martinez is, and anybody that plays on that football team, you know, Adi Canali, Eddie Canali, he was a football Canalic. player. Is it Canalic? Yeah. I think so. He's, yeah. he's doing some – he was a kicker for the team. He's down in Lincoln doing some incubator stuff, I think, yeah. and they've got a company down there as well. And so some of those Huskers stay around. That's a little local talk for us. But, uh, <laughs> Ryan, thanks for – Ryan, thanks for taking an hour out of your time uh, to be with us tonight. And uh, we'll definitely get you – if I ask you to come back on again, would you would you jump back in and maybe dig on dig in on some news? Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and we'll, I'll make sure to uh, – We'll line some line some other people up too to kind of come on and talk about what they're working on. Yeah, if, they, if it's particularly gadget driven, that always does, and, and even web gadgets. So anything mm -hmm. that's on the web that's kind of interesting, you know, our demographic is is uh, 25 to 55 males, you know, who are into technology. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. that's, that's generally who we. Well, I'm and, sure uh, I'll hear from people who are outside that age range that. I'm listening, <laughs> but that's generally. Yeah, yeah. The the. Uh, Wearables, Internet of Things, all that yeah. stuff is just blowing up right now. And right. people in maker spaces, um, all kinds of people making really, really cool stuff. So uh, I'm sure that in the future there's going to be a lot of people doing interesting stuff yeah. in that space. That would be great. If you got some, if you got some folks that kind of rise to the top, uh, and then we'll, they'll do a podcast to send them my way, and we'll give you some, uh, we'll give you some time to have you back on the podcast, Ryan. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Tim. Thanks, thanks, Mike. You bet. Yeah. Well, Thank you. See you later. <laughs> Ryan, we're going to let you drop. Up in the top there is just the red the red hang-up. Thanks again. Got it. All Thanks right. Take care. Yep. See ya. Well, that was fun. Fantastic. That was super fun. I mean, yeah. I, God, it's just awesome. I mean, that's just – you're not going to hear that too many other places. I'm, no. I'm not going to lie. It's one of those kinds of things. You're, you're just not going to get that many podcasts that, that do that kind of stuff. So is it necessarily gadget-related? No. Is it tech-related? Sort of. But it's really cool what they're doing here. I mean, for you and me, especially in Omaha, it's kind of cool to hear the story. And I think we'll maybe pull some interviews out of here. It would be kind of fun to see what's going on in these incubators. Omaha is a strong community for that. And so it will be fun to hear maybe some of these stories that come out. So, Agreed. Pretty cool. Well, I mentioned uh, as we wrap things here, I mentioned uh, earlier in the show that we were uh, – well, Mike, let's cover you first. You have, you've you been ramping up your Hue Light uh, purchases, and you got a couple more. You're doing this ahead of the Amazon Echo. Is that kind of – how are you controlling them now? Yeah, okay, so the idea was to kind of get – well, I just couldn't wait. So I ordered the Amazon Echo, and there's a month, and I just got so excited. I'm like, you know what? I'll just get the lights anyway. And uh, so I, I grabbed all the lights. I grabbed five of them. And actually, I grabbed three first and then added two once I figured out I actually did like them. And the idea was kind of to get my wife on board first, get her kind of used to the whole idea of not using the switch on the wall. And honestly, for me, it's been kind of a challenge, too. We keep hitting the switch instead of using the app. It's, but um, one of the nice things with the Hue app is that it adds a widget on the iPhone. So when you pull down your notification center, you can just pull down the notification center and start tapping your different scenes. So... Uh, 
I have really liked it. I set well, our balcony one up on if this, then that for just the typical uh, sunrise, sunset. It turns on at night for my dog so that I'm, I heard, you might have heard him barking, barking right, right now. now. Yeah, he's going crazy right now. I don't know if, if mom's home. But, uh, but yeah, so the light turns on for him at night and turns back off in the morning when the sun comes up. So just a lot of ease of use things. And once the echo comes in, that's going to be where it, it's just dynamite. Because right now, my wife and I, as a joke, we'll sit on the couch and we'll say, uh, Alexa, turn our turn the lights off right now. and uh, Or Alexa, turn the bedroom lights on. You know, And we can't do it. But once we do it and once it's all connected, it'll be great. So Yeah. No, I think you'll really like it. We Each week, you get more and more dependent on that thing. And it's just really cool. Each week, they add something new uh, to it. And so calendar integration came. If this and that continues to get some really good integrations into it, uh, we're just going to get some internet of things stuff, uh, tied into it. And so I don't think it'll be too long before we get thermostat integration and some of those other things that are going to come on, come along with it. So pretty exciting. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I think they'll start to add more too. I mean, right now just the Wemo, uh, switches and the Philips Hue lights, but I think we'll have more. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> my as he mutes the dog. Yeah, I'm trying, to, yeah, I'm trying to catch it right no, as he barks. He's just that's going good, crazy man. right now. So, uh, it's, if you need to, I'll talk a little bit about the broadcast server if you need to check real quick. Okay, just to make sure. So we had talked a little bit about using Azure as the broadcast server uh, in the configuration here with the podcast, and I, we we talk a little bit about this. But one of those tech things, you know, in the studio, I use a Core i7 16 gig. SSD box that is the broadcast server. That's what you're, or that's the studio PC. That's what you're hearing and seeing on the camera, and uh, that's kind of what drives everything you're seeing right now. But to make this work from a video and audio standpoint, we push that. We actually have. I had a, a second PC. It was a Core i3 Fujitsu um, TX100 S2. Man, I can't believe I remember that, but I just looked at it yesterday. So that's why I got really nerdy on that. But it uh, it was a second PC that I would feed the audio and video into with the Google Hangout and had an audio jumper, a physical jumper coming out of the sound card. So a, a plug into the speaker and then that would wrap around into the microphone. And that would allow me to push Spreaker, Mixler, some of those things out to you. We actually, uh, lots you can do with that when you uh, put it in that kind of configuration. Well, this week when my wife, when Sarah's PC bit it, I thought, you know, I wonder if I can, uh, I've been doing some other work, actually I did an Ask the Podcast Coach with Mike Howard a month or so ago and tried some new equipment and with that new equipment I was watching a video and used an application called Voice Meter, which is available for, and it's M-E-E-T-E-R, Voice Meter, uh, yeah, when you're looking that up and it's a little app that actually creates virtual audio cables on your PC that would allow you to talk and record this kind of thing, I could put it on this PC and it would feed that audio out of the speaker and around to the microphone virtually. I was uh, wondering how you did that. I was I was wondering yeah. how was it. So yeah, we're using Voice Meter uh, uh, today uh, on the. Uh, um, we, so today, what we've done is I just fired up on Azure. I fired up a Windows Seven instance. Now, I need to be kind of clear about this because it caused a little confusion. You can go. You can go to Azure today. If you go to Azure.com, you get a $200 credit just for starting. That's for a month. Mike Howard is doing this experiment right now. You can do a pay-as-you-go plan, but the operating systems are not available unless you're on an MSD subscription, and those get really expensive. That's like a, the one we get as MVPs is like a $7,000 subscription. So it's pretty, the average guy. This is not for the average guy. But wait, there's there's a there's a happy ending to the story. So don't say, oh, I could never do anything like this. So we discovered this week, well, the average guy isn't really going to purchase a $7,000 MSDN subscription to do something like this. And the operating systems on Azure, which would be Windows 7, Windows 8, and Windows 10, are only available on those MSDNs. You, you do get server, which we'll come back to here in just a second. So what we did with, uh, with the broadcast server is I had a Windows 7 instance already running up there. Started that, installed the software on it, put voice meter on it. Uh, install the Spreaker or the uh, the Mixler app. Spreaker runs on it. We open up a Google Hangout and we're pushing that up to uh, a server instance at the Microsoft Data Center in Redmond, Washington. And we're getting 300 up and 300 down, which is pretty sweet. Not not gonna lie, that's the fastest I've ever had anywhere, you know, at any time, right? I mean, Mike, those are some ripping fast speeds. 
Oh, I mean, yeah, you're not as good as Google Fiber, but you're getting up there. I mean, that's that's as good as you're going to get. You're getting pretty close for for that kind of environment, and yeah. uh, and so that's well, pretty attractive. Price too. Oh yeah, well let's talk about the price for oh, a yeah. second. So I'm running a four core box with uh, I think eight gig of RAM on it. And, yeah, a four core, eight gig. It costs me. Uh, get ready. It's like thirty cents an hour for us to run this box. That's up. There. I could even afford that, and that's saying something. Yeah, thirty cents an hour. <laughs> Right, and by the way, this will become important here in a, in, a, in a minute when we talk about the server OSs. But so um, I think it's 36 to be exact. 36 cents an hour is what I'm running right now. They have plans as low as you can get it as low as two cents an hour, but you get like a quarter of a CPU and like 750 some uh, megs, not gigs, 750 meg of RAM. Right, it's not really small instances if you wanted to do those in the cloud. And those like two cents an hour. So. Um, uh, got the the VMs fired up, running out there on on um, uh, Azure. We've got the the Google Hangout running. It's broadcasting. I think it's done a beautiful job tonight. So pr- pretty cool to have that completely. So to what you're watching right now, if you're watching this, you're actually watching the instance that's coming from Redmond, the data centers in in the Seattle area. And uh, pretty cool. I mean, Mike, have you noticed any difference in in the in the quality at all from your side? Not from my side. I mean, as soon as I restarted my modem, I actually saw a little bit of a difference on my end. But uh, no, not from my end. But I'm sure our, I'm sure the viewers are noticing how crispy it looks and and sounds. So yeah, and I, I don't think it was that bad before. And I don't know if it's all that much better that you would notice. But right. we wouldn't run into if all of a sudden one of the kids started downloading something or right. We had some network traffic, and I don't, I don't do queues or priorities or any of that stuff and uh, you know you might lose some bandwidth in that well now I know all I got to worry about is what I'm pushing out so as long as I can get right. it to the data center there at Google so it can get it it's the server it's running on it's not going to run in any problems it's it's you know it's containered off and is doing its thing and I have full I have full pretty much full access to what I'm doing there so well and that bandwidth taken down and putting back up even just having that extra hangout running in your house that alone frees up on your end. So maybe that's why we're getting a clearer sound from you. Yeah, it could be because typically I get about 12 up. That's kind of 12 to 15 up Two hangouts run those. That'll push it to, that'll push it close. There's some room in there, but the kids are always doing something along those lines. So you get 12 up from Cox. I do 12 to 15. Yeah. It's kind of what I get here in Bellevue, but it's not that way all the time. It's not guaranteed. The last couple of times I've run this instance on Azure, it's been 300 each way, which is just stupid, right? You just go, oh, man, that's awesome. Oh, by the way, bandwidth. So on Azure, you don't pay for anything coming in. You only pay what goes out. And so you get the first five gig each month for free, which is not too bad. I'm going to burn. I will probably burn through that in two podcasts, so I will probably get into the larger. But if I go to the six gig, that's 12 cents. Yeah, a dime and two pennies. I don't know if you'll go through it, though, because you're not sending any video out. You're only sending an audio signal no, the to the video, Rico, right? The, the, I think there is a video component going out back to Google. Uh, and so, Even if you have it turned off? Well, we're I, broadcasting right now. Okay. So I think that's taking up quite a bit of bandwidth. We're going to check when we're done. But yeah, that'll be the interesting. Point. It's 12 cents a gig, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. so <laughs> it's... You know, it, 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 now if you're going to be a podcaster and you're going to worry about, you know, pennies, like some of our podcasting friends do, like, I can't afford a $5 plan at Podbean or whatever. Well, then, yeah, good, good, good to go, Mike. Good choice. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to hold them. Uh, you just, just got to hold them. It's you just got to make, make them know they're loved. Oh, I just, I need you so much. Yeah, right? now he's calm. Now he's just going to sit here. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah. Yeah, 12 cents a gig, which isn't bad. And uh, and so we're going to try this experiment out. So you say, well, Jim, I can't afford the $7,000 plan. And you can't. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask you to buy it. The pay-as-you-go plan does include server operating systems. So Mike Howard and I last night, I'm like, huh, I wonder if – and actually somebody on Twitter, who was it? It was one of the guys, uh, I think it was Dwayne Johnson or one of his – or Dwayne um, – oh, Dwayne's going to kill me when he when he says that, how much I've just butchered his last name. But – Dwayne and if the um, our Azure Microsoft guy, uh, it was actually a friend of his said, "Hey, uh, install the desktop experience on on Server 2012." There's and so I went in there and installed the desktop experience and it actually lit up the sound card, the virtual sound card, 
and it um, and I did this actually locally, but it, then it then I could install Voice Meter and I could do the exact same thing on server and it still works. So Mike and I tried it out last night and voila! But and guess what? The server isn't any more expensive than the OS VMs, right? From that standpoint, and micro they're like available to everybody. And so you could, if you go pay as you go, if you wanted to try this out, you could go to Azure.com right now. Get a $200 credit for your first month. It's pretty hard to spend $200 unless you crank up everything to its highest levels and let them run 24-7. You would be surprised. This is one of those kind of things. Mike Howard jumped in. I think if you've been holding off on Azure, this might be one of those times that you want to jump in and give it a try because it's super, super easy, I think. Mike can uh, Mike can attest to that out there in the chat room. We walked through a few things. I got a great control panel, but you could set this up. Now, why you would set this up on the server, and I don't mean you, Mike, but I mean the listener. Well, okay, this may not be your use case, right? It was a pretty cool use case for me. And well, so, it's just kind of a fun experiment you can play around with. You know, it's kind of like a playground that you can just kind of play with and not worry about anything. That's what I like about it. Yeah. No. Yeah, Something. it's something to try. I, I've been messing around with Azure for a year. This is the first real production thing that I've come up to use with it to use it for, right? And I was like, oh, okay. This is, I mean, I put servers up there, but those don't make any sense to run storage servers 24-7 up on Azure. That just doesn't make any sense. There's cheaper ways to do that through other services. But this is a service I can't run anywhere else. It's available on Azure. It's really hard to get your Windows VMs in the cloud running. So Works. There, there it is, powered by Azure, and uh, another one, um, yeah, Mike said he spun up a Windows 2012 server, R2, pretty fast. They, they, they're, they're up and running pretty fast. They blow, they blast those things onto the disk, and pretty cool. If you have any questions around it, shoot me a note, jim at theaverageguy.tv, and, and uh, I'm not, not hard at all. Is Once you're in, it's an average guy thing for sure. Just be aware of what you're spending. Understand the pricing. It can get pricey on some things. Uh, but you might want to give Azure a try as well. Speaking of budget, one more thing, Mike, before we go. we I picked up a, a new uh, Dell 24-inch. It's an E2414HR, a little budget monitor from Dell, a little 24-inch budget monitor, 140. Beast amount on the back, uh, the, the two, the DVI and the VGA connectors below. Exactly what I needed. I needed to replace a monitor that was going upstairs. I needed it to go here, and actually, I'm going to order a second one so I have matching. I've never had matching <laughs> dual monitors, right? I, always... That's so funny you say that. I've been watching so many setup tour videos on YouTube, and it makes me so envious of like matching monitors because mine's like one Samsung, one's BenQ, all different sizes. It just kind of doesn't look nice. So yeah, I'm envious. Yeah, it it's and I've never had it either. To be honest, they've always been two different monitors and. So I'm running a 24-inch, uh, that the new one I just bought, and then there's a 22-inch doll. I've had, actually, I bought this for the kids. This is one that just won't keep, that just won't give up the ghost, right? It's a, right. We bought it for the kids, like, and it was expensive when we first bought it. But we bought this thing six, seven years ago, maybe, eight. I mean, and it it has just been a rock-solid 22. It's, it's just not the same as this one. <laughs> right. You know? And it, 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 it was a dilemma. It was like, oh, you know, 140 bucks. Not a not a bad deal for that size, I think, for what you're getting. You can get them cheaper, but you don't want to go too cheap with monitors. You know, it's right. You know, and I don't need IPS. I don't need the, I don't need the ultra sharp. I mean, I could. It's another hundred bucks. Uh, the kids have that. I just don't need it for what I do. This is fine. And so, uh, if you're out there, I'll drop the link to that in the show notes if you want to take a peek at it. And of course, we always appreciate you using the Amazon. Link. Well, and that's the problem with being the tech guy is, you know, just like you have extra monitors lying around. How do you justify buying a new one? It's like, okay, the reason we have mismatched monitors is because we we used one that we had lying around. It works. It'll do the job. And we just never justify going out, spending the money to buy two matching ones. So it's a blessing and a curse. We don't spend as much money, but we also... This week, I would, so I was going back and forth, and I've been reading this uh, this book called Mind Hacking. And uh, I'll, I'll leave the link for that in the show notes. It's an open source book. Anybody can download it. Uh, it'll be available. We're going to actually interview the author of that book here in, I don't know, six or seven weeks. He's coming on a little bit, August sometime. But uh, so I've been reading his book, Mind Hacking, and he's got some concepts in there around like, you know, you have to, sometimes there's things you don't want to do and you just need to take one step after the other to get them done. Don't think about the whole process. Just take them one step at a time. 
do this step and then do this step. And so as I was sitting here thinking about my monitors, I was like, oh, Jim, just you've always wanted, you know, you've always wanted matching monitors. Right? I've never had it. Just do it. And I had to physically just, because, dude, I am super cheap, right? And it was like, no, I've got it. They're perfectly fine, right? They're perfectly fine. And then I'm like, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I just did it. I was just like, it's one of those things. It's like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pull this off. So I don't do that very often. You guys know I go to buy stuff and then it takes me a month or two or three to pull the trigger on it, on those kinds of things. I bought a Surface really late in the game, but I just decided good deal, good price. I like it. They'll match. We're in. So head out to the show notes. Read that book too. Uh, if you get a chance, head out to the show notes and grab Mind Hacking. We're going to have that author on here in a little bit. And uh, interesting tech story to this all. Another interesting interview. And uh, I know it's not necessarily gadget related, but what he's doing is pretty cool. So I want to kind of highlight that as well. Mike, anything else you want to bring in before we wrap this up and go into a post show? I don't think so. What a great show though. Great guest. Uh, yeah. Wrapped up with some good stuff. And yeah. We'll call good. it a well, weekend. Yeah, you bet. If you can stay around for a few minutes, we'll do some post-show. Remember, you don't get the post-show unless you come out for the live show. Although I'm toying with the idea of putting the post-show on Patreon because everybody's doing that these days, oh, right? That's and a I, good know nothing about, I know nothing about Patreon. Lots of times people say, Jim, we want to – I think you've even had people ask me, we want to donate to the show because you don't charge anything. And I'm like, I don't have a donation link. <laughs> I just don't do that. But what one of the thoughts was is just uh, put put – you know, access to a Patreon um, channel, whatever, a dollar a month, and you get access to all the post shows. And that's something that, you know, because I don't often include those things in, but that may be a way of supporting the show. I, I'm not doing it for the money. I just kind of want to see how this, you know, that's why I'd make it. It's a, it's a great right. platform. You know, I, I had one laying around for a while, and then I just recently decided, you know what, I want to kind of get rid of all the affiliate links and go straight Patreon if the listeners will do it. And so I love the platform. It's it's great. Yeah. Well, I, I just – you kind of – you did it. Dave Jackson's been talking about it as from a podcasting standpoint. I've always been wondering from a community standpoint what anybody – you know, that would – what that would be is for a way if you've ever wanted to support the network in some way. Some guys and gals really feel like they want to contribute in some way. And when I short-circuit that by saying, well, there's really no way to do that except to buy from Amazon, right? And they're like, well, I don't want to buy from Amazon, right? Right. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm considering that. I don't, I don't need, I don't need it, right? It's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just, it's one of those things that's like, I want to provide it. It would be kind of a fun experiment just to see how it goes. If two people do it, it's fine with me. Yeah. Um, but we may give that a try. So if you're uh, if you're a regular listener to that, you might want to kind of listen. Well, as I have time, it might take me a couple weeks to pull this together. But really quickly, when we go into the post show, I'll we'll cut those out and throw them on Patreon and access a dollar a month to it. And and if you want to support the show, you can. If you don't want to, that's fine too. If I, I may even make that available for free too. Just a way. The other the other thought was to just put the show, the full show, on Patreon. And if people want it, it's like, hey, if you want to support it, do it. If you don't, don't. I don't care. It's available in both places. It's free and it's a dollar. So, but if you want to support it, fine. It would just be an easy way for people to, you know, who maybe wanted to support it to be able to do it. So, yeah, that, that I may try that experiment just to see what you guys do. And again, I don't need it. I don't need it. But some people want to do it. So we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. Just a quick couple of reminders before we go. Don't forget, although I have to apologize, I never got a June newsletter out, and I apologize for that. June is going to get skipped. Just with everything that's been going on in my life, I just never got it done. I've actually got it half written, so it'll probably show up in July, and so uh, that's coming out. But if you haven't subscribed for the newsletter, we just had somebody do that today. Go out to theaverageguy.tv slash newsletter. You can go back all the issues that I've written if you want to read those as well as get subscribed to the new one. I'll send it to you in an email each month so you don't have to go hunt it down uh, or find it. It will show up in your email. We are live on Saturday mornings. And when I say we, I mean me and Dave Jackson are live Saturday mornings at it, askthepodcastcoach.com, a fun little uh, podcast that we do around podcasting. So if you're thinking about the technology around podcasting or maybe even starting your own podcast, we have a lot of fun. 9.30 a.m. It is a.m. Mike, I am totally surprised how many people we get out for that show. It's a good show, though. Saturday mornings <laughs> at 9.30. When Dave started that, I was like, you're freaking crazy. Like, nobody yeah. will come out. This this is the stupidest time ever. We have more live people out at 9.30 Central on a Saturday morning. It's than actually I get the perfect time. 
Yeah. I think because yeah. I I think about it. The times that I've been able to watch are I wake up on Saturday morning at eight, you know, and we're just kind of laying around the house. Oh yeah, I'll go lay by. My, I'm already on my computer in the morning, right. and you just pop it right. up. I think it's yeah. a great time. It's crazy. Uh, it's a good it's a good crowd, and it's a good tech crowd. Some of you have already joined that are listening to this. You join me on Saturday mornings, but we do that nine thirty. 10:30 Eastern out at Ask the Podcast Coach. dot com. Thanks for listening to this. Uh, the audience is super important to both Mike and I. We have a blast every week, and uh, we really enjoy the fact that uh, you come out and you do as well. Thanks for letting me know that you do. It's always nice to get those emails from you saying that you're listening and you enjoy it. And uh, we're live here every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out at the Average Guy. TV live. If you're listening live, stay around for the post show. Remember, you don't get the post show unless you come to the live show or you're a Patreon. I'm going to have to, I'm, I'm weaving that in, right? I'm gonna there you go. See how that's start, start it now. That's right. And with that, we'll go into the post show. Good night, everybody. <laughs>